coming on the air tonight with what could be, what could be a watershed moment for social media. Anger, emotion, blame aimed at tech CEOs from senators today and from parents who point the finger at some of these social media companies for playing a part in their children's suicides. This stunning moment, Meta's CEO turned around and apologized directly to them coming up in just a second. Plus, what we're learning about a disturbing and gruesome murder posted on YouTube for everybody to see, while a Pennsylvania man talked about right-wing conspiracy theories. The suspect allegedly behind it all, now in police custody. Plus, concerns about crime in Oakland is prompting one big company to offer its employees security escorts to and from their cars. They're not the only ones making changes. What it signals about the situation in the Bay Area. Then, Disney telling NBC News tonight it is going to keep fighting even after a federal judge threw out its lawsuit against Governor Ron DeSantis for alleged retaliation over the state's so-called don't say gay law. We've got those late developments live in just a minute. Plus, right-wing media and allies of former President Trump burning red over Taylor Swift. We're going to debunk some of the wildest conspiracies about Swift that's causing all of this. Yes, bad blood. We said it. That's later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight, what could be a critical moment on Capitol Hill with major tech CEOs lining up to answer to senators who say they failed to protect children. We're talking about blistering questions, hot criticism, not just from lawmakers, but these CEOs also forced to confront some of these parents dressed in black, holding photos of their dead children. They say social media contributed to their kids' suicides, leading to a moment that we have never seen play out like this before at the Capitol. The head of Meta, Mark Zuckerberg, literally turning around to apologize to them. Watch this. Victim, let me I ask said. you this. Let me ask you this. There's families of victims here today. Have you apologized to the victims? I, Would I'm, you like to do so now? Well, they're here. You're on national television. Would you like now to apologize to the victims who have been harmed by your product? Show them the pictures. Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? I'm sorry for everything that you've all gone through. It's terrible. No one should have to go through the things that your families have, have suffered. We are going to show you more of that in just a second with the committee's chair saying this is the biggest audience he's ever seen at a hearing in his more than two decades on this committee. The tension, I mean, you could feel it in the room with one senator laying out what he sees as what's on the line very clearly. Listen. Mr. Zuckerberg, you and the companies before us, I know you don't mean to, it to be so, but you have blood on your hands. You have a product. You have a product that's killing people. You see Mark Zuckerberg there. It wasn't just him, right? It was Zuckerberg, but also top executives from X, TikTok, Snap, Discord, all of them appearing, some after having been served subpoenas personally from U.S. Marshals to come in, come to the Capitol, blocks from where we're standing, and show up today. You've heard us talk about it here on this show, report after report showing just how bad social media can be for the mental health of teenagers and how sexually abusive material targeting kids can thrive on some of these platforms. The reality is that these tech companies are protected under law, something called Section 230, which shields these companies from responsibility for what's posted on their platforms by other people. That was a big focus today. What laws, if any, could Congress realistically pass to try to hold these companies more account accountable and, importantly, make these platforms a safer place? I want to bring in Ryan Nobles on Capitol Hill because that issue, safety, that is one thing that everybody, no matter where they were sitting in that room, on the dais or across from it, agreed on. And you saw some of these execs today kind of offering in, in some ways, all the branches on what they could do to support some of these potential laws or not, all with some incredibly fiery moments. What stood out to you? I think the thing that stood out to me uh, above all, Hallie, was kind of the, the uniform bipartisan a condemnation of the way the tech industry has handled this particular issue of child safety. You know, normally when you have hearings like this, you know, one side may be more inclined to defend the witnesses that are appearing before them, while the other side feels more inclined to attack. That wasn't the case today. You saw both Republicans and Democrats being very critical of the way the tech industry has handled it. Uh, and they also, to a certain extent, acknowledged how they Congress has been unable to do very much to solve this problem. Listen to what Senator Amy Klobuchar had to say. It's been 28 years, what, since the internet? We haven't passed any of these bills because everyone's double talk, double talk. It's time to actually pass them. And the reason they haven't passed is because of the power of your company. So let's be really, really clear about that. So what you say matters. Your words matter. 
And Senator Klobuchar is correct about that. The tech companies have wielded incredible influence over these platforms and the way that they are regulated. And they've stood in the way of a lot of this legislation that lawmakers have proposed over the years. But there are five bills in particular I want to point to, Hallie, that are currently making their way through the Senate in particular. Some have to do with increasing accountability for transparency on online platforms. There's one that removes the text blankets immunity from civil and criminal liability. That was a huge topic here today, giving people the ability to sue if they feel that they've been victimized by something that happened on an online platform. The SHIELD Act gives federal prosecutors the appropriate and effective tools to deal with this. There's also the Childhood Safety Act, which moder modernizes the pr prosecution of online child sex exploitation crimes. And then there's the Kids Online Safety Act, which also creates a layer of liability. Uh, it's important to point out, these are all proposed pieces of legislation. None of them are anywhere near being passed. So while there's a lot of blame being laid at the feet of these tech titans, it's also important to point out that Congress has a responsibility here and Congress has failed to act. And let's be, to, to sort of put a pin on that point, Ryan, and then we'll get to some of those dramatic moments here. We put together, this is not Mark Zuckerberg's first rodeo, getting hauled in front of a committee on Capitol Hill. Same thing for the head of TikTok. We actually created a graphic to show the other times that they've showed up here. This is not new. Senator Blackburn, for example, Senator Blumenthal, they've held other hearings on some of these concerns from social media companies. You see it here. They've, they've done this before, which gets to this question of, who is the onus actually on to try to keep kids safe? And this goes back to what we talked about at the top of this segment, Ryan, at the top of the show, safety being the paramount thing here. How do you make sure that kids, teenagers can use these platforms and be okay doing it? That was the subject of some of these really dramatic moments that we saw. Let me play some of that. If you're waiting on these guys to solve the problem, we're gonna die waiting. It appears that you're trying to be the premier sex trafficking no, of course not, Senator. In this uh, country. Senator, that's ridiculous. No, S it Senator, is not ridiculous. Uh, have you ever been a member of the Chinese Communist Party? No, Senator. Again, okay. I'm Singaporean. Uh, Senator, my understanding is that we don't allow sexually explicit content uh, on, on the service for people of any age. Um, the, the, um, how is that going? <laughs> I mean, it was like that for hours, Ryan, right in this room. Give us a sense of some of the color in the room, especially when it comes to some of the facts at hand, because unlike perhaps some other issues that Congress might look at, there's a fair amount of research. There's a fair amount of a body of evidence here done by independent experts that look specifically at these issues as it relates to kids and social media. Yeah, and, you know, there's a lot of evidence out there that there is a very uh, negative impact on young people that are using these social media platforms, particularly uh, in those middle teen years that uh, has been demonstrated over time. And I want to point you to this study that The Washington Post reported on as it relates specifically to Meta. And it says that Meta reported by far the largest number of CSAM files on its platform in 2022, the most recent year for which company-specific data is available, with more than 21 million reports on Facebook alone. Google reported 2.1 million, Snapchat 550,000, TikTok 290,000, and Discord 170,000. Twitter, which of course is now an X, reported just under 100,000. Uh, you know, this is a, a massive amount of data, a massive amount of evidence that demonstrates the problem here. And then when you get back to your earlier question, who's responsible here? Well, there's no doubt that the social media companies have a, at least somewhat of an ability to self-regulate themselves, but it seems pretty clear that they're not going to take the dramatic action necessary unless the Congress and unless law enforcement gets to that place where they can regulate them. And it's been done in other places. Europe has already started the process of really starting to rein in the ability for kids to be on these social media platforms and have access to some of this material. It's time now that you're starting to see here in the United States uh, at least yeah. uh, some sort of mo at least momentum towards getting something done soon. That's a great point. Ryan Nobles, thank you so much. We're glad you're there for us on, again, what could be a critical moment here for these companies, or it could not be. Thanks. Take overseas now because U.S. officials are saying today that an un, that a, essentially umbrella group of Iran-backed mil, militias planned and facilitated the drone attack that killed three American service members in Jordan this weekend. Listen. It certainly has the earmarks of the kinds of things that Qatab Hezbollah does. As the president said, we're going to respond and we'll, we'll respond in, in an appropriate way. Okay, again, these questions. What does that response look like? Well, we are learning some new details tonight about what that response could be, with U.S. officials describing it to NBC News as a campaign 
their word, a campaign, which is an indication that it's not going to be a one-off thing. It could last potentially for weeks. At the same time, one of the militant groups, the U.S. says, could be behind that attack. You just heard John Kirby reference it there. Qatab Hezbollah says it's suspending attacks on U.S. forces, a decision they say is aimed at preventing the embarrassment of the Iraqi government. With all of this happening, you've got the Secretary of State headed back to the region in the next few days, according to a senior U.S. official. Keir Simmons has been following every minute of this. He is joining us now. So let's get to this question of options, a quote-unquote campaign indicating yeah. a series of events. We don't know what that events would look like. Do we know anything about at least the preps for a response? Talk us through it. Well, the president actually has quite limited options, honestly, uh, Hallie. I, he's, it's clear, I think, from what the White House has been saying in the past 24 hours that he has not decided to hit inside Iran. Uh, no U.S. president has uh, made that decision since the Iranian Revolution in 1979, and for a reason, which is that if you do that, you risk that the Iranians will feel forced to truly respond in order to show that America shouldn't do it again. And, and Israel, uh, for example, uh, here in Iraq, uh, I think we will likely see some strikes. But Iraq, strangely, is both a partner of Iran and the US. Uh, so the danger is that if you go too strong here in Iraq, you push Iraq uh, towards Iran and, and encourage Iraqi lawmakers to demand uh, the um, pushing out of um, US forces here. So I think the focus will likely be on Syria. I suspect we'll see more on Yemen. But Yemen is a good example of where the challenges are too, because of course, we saw those strikes on the Houthis. That wasn't a one-off. And now we've seen, I think, eight, maybe more now, um, since that started. And still, the Houthis still keep firing on those ships in the, in, in the Red Sea. Uh, so I think trying to uh, figure out how to get these Iranian-backed uh, militia uh, in this region to stop attacking U.S. bases and, and stop the kind of attack that saw uh, three uh, service, U.S. service uh, members killed over the weekend. How you do that is a real is a real challenge. At the same time, of course, the president will feel that, that he has to do something. So yeah, a campaign over a sustained period, waves of strikes, I think is what we, we would expect. Um, and, and not just kinetic, they're saying, but also cyber. Keir Simmons, live for us there in Iraq. Keir, we're glad to have you there. Thank you very much. Right now, more than 20 million people over on the West Coast are under flood watches, bracing for two huge storms with the potential to bring total chaos. Ton of rain, ton of snow, a lot of potential for flooding here, with some spots set to get as much as five inches of rain. This storm's coming in, another one right on its heels. Kathy Park is in Half Moon Bay up in Northern California. A gorgeous spot, Kathy, but the rain is coming down already. This is only going to intensify over the course of the next few days, right? Hallie, that's absolutely right. What you're seeing right now is just a sampling of what's to come because conditions are expected to worsen in the next couple of hours, specifically right around the evening commute. We're anticipating heavier bands of rain. Right behind me is the bay right now. You can probably see the waves pretty ferocious, just crashing over the rocks. This is something that we've been seeing throughout the day today. But believe it or not, Hallie, some extreme athletes, kite boarders to be exact, they said that these conditions were just optimal for getting that extra lift in the sky. But of course, California officials are urging residents, telling them to be on alert because this weather can can be extremely dangerous. And over the next couple of hours into tomorrow morning, we're anticipating several inches of rain that could lead to flash flooding. And of course, the other big headline that we've been tracking are these wind gusts, extreme wind gusts, anywhere between 40 to 70 mile per hour wind gusts have been clocked all over Northern California today. And that's expected to progress over the next few hours into the overnight hours. So uh, officials have been prepping, um, just getting ahead of the storm putting sandbags on levees. They're cleaning up drains as well just to make sure that all that is cleared up to make sure that flooding isn't an issue. But they're also telling residents to use this time now while there is a little bit of a pause before things really start to pick up to charge your phones, download those emergency alert apps so that you are ready if things do get bad. Hallie? Kathy Park, live for us there in Half Moon Bay. Uh, I'm sure we'll be checking back in with you in the days to come. Kathy, thank you. House Republicans are promising to hold what they're calling a long overdue vote to try to impeach the Homeland Security Secretary, with the House Speaker devoting his very first speech on the House floor to criticizing how both Alejandro Mayorkas and President Joe Biden are approaching immigration. Watch. But it's crystal clear his policy choices and Secretary Mayorkas's refusal to comply with the law 
are driving this border catastrophe. The party line vote late into the night overnight advances the first impeachment charges against a cabinet secretary since Alexander Graham Bell's first telephone call nearly 150 years ago. We haven't seen this in more than a century and a half. David Noriega is joining us now live from Eagle Pass, Texas, which, David, has really become the nexus, the flashpoint for this fight happening currently over the border with this so-called Take Back Our Border convoy apparently headed your way. What's going on? Yeah, Hallie, Eagle Pass is not only a flashpoint, it's also become, uh, uh, you know, the border has always been a stage for political theater on both sides of the spectrum, and uh, especially right now, and right now, Eagle Pass is the main stage. That's a part of why this convoy is ostensibly headed this way. Here's what we know. This is a, a group of self-described patriots, Trump supporters, you know, right-wing activist types. A lot of them are religious, uh, what sort of experts who look at, at uh, organizations like these describe as Christian nationalists. They're operating under the name Take Our border back. Some of them refer to themselves as God's army. The plan, as they described it, was to uh, sort of convoy during the course of this week and then meet at three different points on the border. Near here in Eagle Pass, uh, in Mesa, Arizona, and in San Isidro, California, which is basically San Diego. Now, I should say that some of the videos we're seeing and some of the reporting we're seeing is that the numbers are not particularly big, at least as of now. They're certainly not anywhere near the 700,000 or so that organizers claimed they would reach. That said, there's still a few days for potentially this convoy to gather strength. And one thing I will say is that being here in Eagle Pass, we've already met several people who've been trickling in over the last couple of days in advance of this convoy. I, I met a guy last night who drove 20 hours from Colorado to be here in Eagle Pass, uh, you know, in place when, when this convoy arrives. I also met an, an older couple yesterday who drove more than five hours from Houston, they were actually here kind of uh, they thought the convoy was already happening, uh, uh, and they were a little bit surprised to find that they were some of the first people here. So that, I think, tells you a little bit about how sort of organized this is. All that said, Hallie, even if this specific convoy, this specific sort of political action turns out to be, you know, a bit of a dud, the conditions are very much present. The tension is very much present for one of these things to be sort of a tinderbox, and, and you know, all you need is a match to light it. Hallie? David Noriega live for us there in Texas. David, thank you. Tonight, some new details on a stunning and gruesome story we've been following. But the Pennsylvania man arrested after allegedly decapitating his father and displaying his head on YouTube while putting out there some right-wing conspiracy theories. We are obviously not going to show you all the disturbing moments from the video, just a bit you can see here. Later on, this man is seen wearing gloves and holding his dad's head in a plastic bag. The head is then seen in a cooking pot. In the video, the son says his father, Michael Moen, was a federal worker for 20 years and calls him a traitor, even as he called for the death of all federal officials. Tom Winter has been all over the story. He's joining us now. Very upsetting details, obviously. Um, incredibly troubling to, to no one more so than this family now dealing with the aftermath of this. What else do we know? Well, that's absolutely right, Hallie. I mean, this is a tragedy because, in fact, it was Justin Moan's mother, according to court documents, uh, who was the person who came home to find him and the family vehicle missing and her husband dead and dead in, obviously, this incredibly gruesome way. Uh, we know that police found a machete and a large knife uh, next to the, uh, to the torso of the body of his father, Michael Moan. We know the three charges. You're looking at them there on the screen. First-degree murder, abuse of a corpse, and possessing an instrument of crime with intent, referring to the weapons that were used in this. Um, he is not going to get bail uh, because of the first-degree murder count uh, makes him not bail eligible. Uh, you're looking here at the video. And basically, detectives say they looked at the video, matched it to the crime scene and what they personally witnessed, and uh, quickly put two and two together. And that's how they arrived with the arrest here, Hallie. So then what about the piece of this, the possibility that this attack may have been politically motivated right. based on what was being said in this video? Right. So the video, and, and detectives here point out that he had a pre-written script, and it's clear if you watch mm. the video, and I certainly don't recommend it, and it's been taken down uh, from YouTube, but it's clear that he's reading from something. And this goes beyond, I mean, he certainly has a number of anti-Biden uh, statements in there, has uh, some, I would say, pretty uh, extreme and fringe uh, right-wing beliefs. It goes beyond that. He calls 
Mills uh, for the killing of all federal employees and for the federal officials. He puts a bounty out uh, for certain very prominent members of the law enforcement community, put out the address of a judge who uh, did not, uh, who dismissed uh, uh, one of four legal cases against him and then uh, had a, a number of uh, hate speech comments, and you're looking at it there, against the Black Lives Matter movement, the LGBTQ community, uh, spoke out against Antifa. So uh, when you look at this in its totality, um, this goes beyond just kind of a, a hard right or a hard left uh, type of uh, speech. This goes uh, into hate speech and those uh, extreme conspiracies that you referenced, Sally. Tom Winter, thank you very much for that update. Okay. Appreciate it. So listen to business news now, because some big news out of the Fed today, not what they did, but what they said, because they did what everybody thought they'd do. They didn't touch interest rates, right? Didn't go up, didn't go down, they're staying the same. But here's what the Fed chair said, that cuts probably will not happen at the Fed's next meeting in March either. That was kind of a surprise to some folks. And if you were hoping that interest rates would go down, well, not exactly what you wanted to hear. Brian Chung is following all of this for us tonight. Uh, and Brian, so listen, we expected, right, the, the interest rates to stay flat. We expected no change to that. Interesting to hear Jay Powell, the Fed chair, one of the most obviously powerful and influential people in, in the economy here in this country, talk about the outlook as it relates to inflation. The concern, right, is if they start to bring those interest rates back down, inflation might start to creep back up. On the other hand, if they don't start to cut interest rates, you could see issues with the broader economic picture, including unemployment, right? This is the fine line they're trying to walk. Yeah, well, it's a real tightrope, and that, this is kind of funny about this news item is that we come on every six weeks and it's like, what's the news? Well, the news is that they didn't do anything, but it's right. notable but that's because still news. it still yeah. is news. Well, the reason right. why is because you know if they did raise interest rates or cut interest rates, that would tell you something about where they see the economy. And at least for right now, they're saying, look, inflation is coming down. We haven't seen job losses really increase, although we have seen layoffs in some sectors, but in the aggregate, not enough to really signal that the Fed needs to change its policy at the moment. Now, what's really interesting is that the Federal Reserve was expected to start cutting interest rates later on this year. It wasn't going to happen in this meeting. It was a 95% chance going into this meeting that they would hold interest rates. But yep. some commentary from the Federal Reserve chairman in the absence of any other news was expected to, okay, well, could that point to their next meeting in March? And the Fed chairman saying, hey, it's unlikely to happen in March as well. That's the reason why markets traded down. But again, we'll have to see how the data come in to see whether or not the Fed does see the economy in a place to cut interest rates perhaps later on in the spring. Still, though, if you look back two years ago, a year ago, do you think we would be talking about what we're talking about today, right? I mean, with some of these dire predictions of the potential for a recession and everything else, what's interesting is as the numbers in many ways have started to get better, inflation is cooling off. As you point out, we could see rate cuts on the horizon eventually. Um, the unemployment numbers are down. People seem to not be feeling that. There's a new poll out today, and if you get into the cross tabs, it shows more than half of Americans say that their own personal financial situation was better under the Trump administration years ago. And this is consistent when you ask a series of economic questions there. Is this a perception issue? Is this a messaging issue? Is this a people aren't feeling the impact in their day-to-day -day budget issue? What is it? Yeah, well, I mean, look, I think we also have to acknowledge that the transition from the Trump into the Biden administration also coincided with the massive shock that was the pandemic and the weirdness of the year following the pandemic, where people mm -hmm. were trying to catch up on things and experiences that they couldn't do, which led to the inflationary episode that we saw that really peaked in 2022. So perception and timing wise, look, there's always going to be certain administrations claiming credit or putting blame on others. But when it comes to the overall macro story, we have to celebrate the fact that this federal Federal Reserve, which, by the way, is independent, doesn't answer directly to the That's president, right. even though they're appointed by the president, was able to steer us out of what everyone thought was going to be a 2023, where people were forecasting a recession. Didn't happen. The unemployment rate didn't rise during the time that the Federal Reserve was break checking into what was going to be slower inflation, which did happen, again, without the rise in unemployment that some, including the Federal Reserve itself, had feared. The question is whether or not that just kicks the can for that potential layoff wave to come in 2024. Again, we're starting to see it in media. We're starting to see it in tech. But whether or not it envelops other types of industries is very much the open question for 2024. But for right now, we'll take what we can get, Hallie. Brian Chung, thank you so much. Good to see you, as always. Lots more to get to coming up here on the show, including why Clorox is hiring extra security for people heading to its Bay Area headquarters. Plus, laser strikes on planes hitting a record high last year. Why are people doing this? We'll talk about what's behind the spike.
France is cutting crowds for the Olympics opening ceremony coming up this summer. You might be surprised by how much. We'll get to that in a second. But first, we're learning today that some businesses in Oakland are hiring private security for employees to walk them from the parking lot into the building. Or even asking folks to take lunch breaks inside because of concerns over crime in the area. Clorox today says they hired uniformed security guards to walk staffers between the office and some of the public transit stations, parking garages, etc. The company says it's also partnering with police to offer safety awareness training for workers. Clorox now becomes the third big business in Oakland to boost these kinds of safety precautions recently. Violent crime in the city was up 21% last year, and for the second straight year, there were at least 120 homicides reported there. Gabrielle Von Rouge is joining us now. Employee safety is a big concern for any company. Yeah, Obviously, there is a cost that comes with, so I was just going to say, cost that comes with security, too, but so talk us through it. Yeah, it's absolutely a concern. I mean, you're right. There is a cost that comes with that. But there's also a company needs to be able to keep their employees safe. And they also need to be able to retain and attract employees. I mean, if people are going to have to commute into high crime areas and walk through high crime areas and able to get into that office, they're going to maybe try to find somewhere else to work. And this is an ongoing issue across the Oakland area. I mean, like you were mentioning, we had the healthcare company Kaiser. They actually asked employees to stay in for lunch after two groups of employees were mugged while they were out getting lunch. And one of those groups were mugged at gunpoint. And then you saw something similar with Blue Shield, the insurance provider, which is also based in Oakland. They have started offering ride share services to their employees just so that they don't have to walk around outside. We've heard about some of these companies, and you've covered it too, Gabra, leaving sort of the broader Bay Area, San Francisco, Oakland, as, as those places are trying to recover from the pandemic. It's you know, the so-called doom loop that we've covered here. What is the expectation for where this goes, what happens next, and the reality check when it comes to um, the city, the Bay Area, kind of getting a handle on some of the crime issues that have been so high profile and talked about so much over the course of the last couple of years? Yeah, I mean, this is an ongoing issue for the Bay Area. It's almost become synonymous with the area that businesses are leaving, crime is up. It's just a dangerous place. I mean, I was recently in San Francisco. I can't say that I felt that dangerous or, or afraid while I was there. And you also have some crime data that's showing that it's coming down. But it's a question of enforcement. Are police officers not just enforcing these crimes anymore, which is making the statistics come down? And, you know, you recently had in and out the burger chain, beloved burger chain in California. They said that they are leaving the Oakland area because crime is making it unsafe for employees and customers. And then, of course, we also had Target last year. I mean, that was one of the you know, highest profile retailers to leave the area. What's interesting, though, is that Target kept a location open nearby in Emeryville. That was just a couple of miles away. And while incidents were technically higher at that location, what my reporting found is that Emeryville may have just been more likely to respond, which is going to be a big mm. factor when these companies are deciding whether or not to stay in a location, how expedient police are in response. Gabrielle Von Rouge over at CNBC. We're so glad to have you. Thank you very much for talking us of through course. all that. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Chris Ray, the head of the FBI, warning Chinese hackers are preparing to, in his words, wreak havoc on key infrastructure in this country. We're talking about electric grids, oil and gas pipelines, some transportation systems. You see Ray there telling a House committee today the hackers could cause real world harm to people here and that there really hasn't been enough focus on the cyber threat. Number two, syphilis in 2022 hit its highest level in this country since the 50s, according to a new CDC report. The agency says cases have gone up 80% in the last five years. And while syphilis is most common in gay and bisexual men, officials say it's now expanding in heterosexual men and women, and increasingly it's affecting newborns. The rate of gonorrhea, however, has dropped for the first time in a decade. Number three, reports of lasers pointed at planes that are flying, illegally, by the way, is spiking. It hit a record high this past year, up 40% from the year before, according to the FAA. The lasers are a problem, folks. They can distract pilots. They can make pilots temporarily blind. Experts say they think they're seeing more of these laser strikes, as they're called, because it's cheap to get some of these laser pointers, and also because more pilots are reporting it when it happens. Number four, some new research out of Harvard and Stanford shows students have made up a lot of ground academically since the pandemic, but they're nowhere close to being caught up. In math, students have made up about a third of what they lost, but it's less in reading, and the gap between wealthy and poor districts has only grown. Number five, France, cutting the number of people set to attend the opening Olympic ceremony in half. It was going to be 600,000 people now there. Now it's only about 300,000 people, so not as many eyeballs there on that big event. 
The organizers have not yet said why they are making this change. You can obviously, of course, watch the opening ceremony right here on NBC when it happens later this summer. When we come back, remember that whole Disney versus DeSantis thing? Well, that lawsuit is getting thrown out today. Why the so-called House of the Mouse may not be done fighting Florida's governor just yet. Plus, an unlikely porch pirate. Stay with us. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, a San Diego high schooler and his dad were arrested because the student was allegedly planning a shooting there. Officials went to their house, and look at this. Here's what they found. Well, I don't know if we can show it to you, but it's explosives. There it is, an RPG, an unregistered gun or two. Officials did not find any explosives on campus, fortunately. They didn't say what charges they may file, but this is definitely one we're watching. Also out of our Southern Bureau, people in a town in Arkansas have not had running water for two weeks now because it's been so cold, below freezing. So look at this. You see people lining up for bottled water. They're trying to take showers at this truck that the state brought in. This is the second time in the past year that this particular town in Arkansas has had this kind of outage. They're trying to get the water back up and running, but they say these problems have been years, decades in the making. Also out of our Southern Bureau, a thief in the night captured on camera. Look at this little sneaky little possum going up, porch pirating. Yes, that is a pack of cookies. <laughs> Snatches it right away. Cookies were gone the next day, just an empty bag. S sad news for the family that lives in that house. Great news for the possum. So, from possums to a mouse and a new wrinkle tonight in the fight between Disney and Florida's governor, with a federal judge late today dismissing a lawsuit from Disney against Ron DeSantis. I know you probably remember what this is all about, that so-called don't say gay law. Disney sued after the governor pulled a special tax status for Disney World in Orlando. They called it an act of retaliation after Disney went against that controversial law back in 22. Today, you've got the judge now throwing the whole thing out, saying that Disney's claims fail on the merits. That's legal speak. We'll unpack that in a second. Saying they don't have any standing to sue DeSantis and his co-defendants. Sam Brock is live for us now in Florida, in Miami. So what's the why from the judge here? What does it mean that the judge says that Disney failed to, to make a case on the merits? Yeah, I'm glad you put this on to me, Hallie, to unpack all the legal speak. Uh, and we will. Uh, but let me just set the stage for a second. So this Reedy Creek Improvement District has been in place since 1967. That is essentially the self-governing body that Disney has been able to control, raise its own taxes, provide for certain services like police and any other sort of government things that would go along with people that live in the area, control what happens on the land. Suddenly, after Don't Say Gay and the controversy that ensued, Governor DeSantis said this is no longer going to be the status quo. The legislature changed the law and as a result appointed a different board to control and make those very decisions. No longer Disney and Disney sued, like you said, because they allege this was done in retaliation and a suppression of free speech. The judge today in federal court dismissed it on two grounds, standing and merit. Let's start with standing. DeSantis had appointed this board, the Central Florida Tourism Oversight Board, and we're going to pull up right now the language from that lawsuit. Here's what they said specifically. To the extent the governor contributed to Disney's injury by appointing Central Florida's and Tourism Board, that action is in the past because Disney seeks injunctive relief. It must allege an imminent future injury, and it has not alleged facts showing that any imminent future appointments will contribute to its harm. On the other end of this, just simply the merit, the judge had to say that you're proving something that is facially constitutional. This is a real law. A plaintiff cannot bring a free speech challenge by claiming that the lawmakers who passed it acted with a constitutionally impermissible purpose. What does that mean? He's saying there's a law here that allows the Florida legislature to amend this district. They did. And you can't just assume they did it out of malice or spite or retaliation. Where is the proof of that? And the judge says that does not exist. Sam Brock, you better be careful. We're going to upgrade you to a legal correspondent any minute now instead of our Florida correspondent. But let me ask you this, because Disney is now late today saying they're going to fight this. So I guess that the next yeah. step is appealing, even as Ron DeSantis, who has, by the way, used this sort of culture war piece of things, attempted to use it for political effects. He's kind of taken a victory lap. 
He absolutely is. I mean, this is a slam dunk for DeSantis, or you might say a spike in the end zone. As far as Disney is concerned, they're saying, hold on. There's a really right. important precedent here. We're going to try to, pr to protect that precedent. Let's pull up Disney's comment for a second. Here's what they said, and I quote, this is an important case with serious implications for the rule of law. It will not end here. If left unchallenged, this would set a dangerous precedent and give license to states to weaponize their official powers to punish the expression of political viewpoints that they disagree with. What does that mean? What does pressing forward mean? Perhaps they try to file another lawsuit, Hallie, under different grounds. Maybe they try to get a reconsideration of this dismissal. DeSantis fights back right after that. He says the federal court's decision made it clear that Governor DeSantis was correct. Disney is still just one of many corporations in the state. They do not have a right to their own special government. So as it stands right now, the federal, the federal court has dismissed this. There is a state case, Hallie, that is still going on, but that state case is actually DeSantis against Disney, not the other way around. So right now it looks like victory DeSantis. Here's the thing, Sam, and just real quick, DeSantis loves a political fight with Disney, right? It's not so clear that Disney is dying for a political fight against Ron DeSantis here. And even if DeSantis loved a political fight with Disney, that culture war platform you were describing, it did not get him the Republican nomination, right? So this was a huge sort of feather in his hat. And here we are. He didn't get the nomination, and Disney is still dealing with the fallout of whatever happened legislatively and from Governor DeSantis' office to try to get back at them, allegedly. 2024, 2028, uh, time is a flat circle. Sam Brock, thank you so much. Appreciate it. So listen, speaking of all things Republican presidential campaign, we've got some developments on that front from here in Washington with former President Trump meeting with the Teamsters Union here in Washington today. This is his motorcade pulling in, not too far actually from where we are. Interesting moment as he is trying to cut into some of President Biden's support. Remember, the Teamsters had endorsed President Biden last go-round. He's addressing when... Former President Trump spoke. He addressed some of these claims, this New York Times reporting, that he spent so far $50 million of his donors' money on legal fees last year. Watch. Are you thinking of potentially trying to use campaign money to pay some of those penalties that you, that you might incur in the, New York in the New York fraud case and the defamation case? I, I didn't do anything wrong. I mean, that's been proven as far as I'm concerned. That was a political case coordinated with the White House by the Attorney General, I assume is what you're talking about. And we won that case largely in the Court of Appeals. Now, according to the Times, the former president's been directing 10 percent of donations raised online to, to a PAC, a political action committee, meaning like 10 cents of every dollar he raises goes to a place that mostly funds his attorneys. NBC News has not independently confirmed that. And we should know, too, we're not going to know these numbers for sure, for certain, until something like midnight tonight. Our teams are looking for it. But it is an interesting moment here with Nikki Haley also chasing some big money donors down in Florida today after going after Mr. Trump saying that Donald Trump can't beat Joe Biden if he's spending all his time and money on court cases and chaos. That's not the only thing Nikki Haley is saying, as Garrett Hake knows, he is joining us now, for all things politics. And there have That's been good. some sort of interesting potpourri-type moments. Let's start with the first bucket of campaign cash mm -hmm. for former President Trump. Not to get too nerdy, not to get too weedsy. Filings obviously do. So we're, we're going to get real insight here, more insight than we have so far, and what exactly he's spending to pay for all these legal issues, which he has, right? Mm -hmm. He's paying lawyers for these legal fights. Talk us through that. Well, his PAC is, and that's part of the problem here. So we're in, we're in fundraising season here now, which is part of why all this matters. And by the way, we have confirmed this idea that money that he is raising is going into this. We know that he's using political money to pay legal fees. And I think that's part of the reason he talked about this. Which, the way by the way, that's he, not illegal. Legal. No, it's not within reason. So, like, that's part of the reason he talked about it the way he did today. The FEC says you can spend money on legal fees if the legal fees arise based on your candidacy. So it's part of the reason why Trump describes all of this as political, that even the Gene Carroll case as political, because it makes it easier for him to argue that money he spends in his defense is related to his campaign. That was that defamation case in which he was slapped with an 80-plus million dollar uh, right. verdict. That's right. And so that's the other part of this, because even if he spent every dime that, that his, spe his special political action committee has raised, he couldn't cover all of that money. He's going to have to spend some of Donald J. Trump's own money to cover that. That's the kind of thing we know he hates, going back to his time in private development. He, he talked about this in his book, that he doesn't like spending his own money on basically anything. He can't really borrow against this. He's going to have to spend his own money here at some point. But we also know that politically, at least in a primary election, his supporters, as we've seen in polling again and again, the Republican primary electorate, they don't mind. No. They don't mind that he's doing this, that this is happening. Maybe a different question come a general election. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, up until now, these charges 
challenges basically across the board have been rocket fuel for his campaign, both in terms of poll numbers and in donations. I mean, it does, it's not only that they don't mind. It's that Republican primary voters They're have identified. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. They've identified with Donald Trump. They agree with him that he's being targeted. They've been more than happy to spend their money. But when you look at some of the polling data about what happens in a general election, you do start to see voters break away. There's a significant percentage of, of Republican-leaning voters, of independent voters, who say in some of these swing states in particular that they will not be as likely to support a candidate who's convicted of something. So, again, the timing starts to matter here, the mm. specifics start to matter here, and the fact that all these cases appear to be getting pushed off is starting to matter, too. And, oh, by the way, the reason he's even talking about this is because he was here making an appearance after this Teamsters meeting. We know mm -hmm. President Biden will also meet with the Teamsters. I believe Nikki Haley is set to meet as well. Union support is going to matter this election. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And it mattered in the last election, too. The, and the break between union leadership and union rank and file has always been something that's accrued to Donald Trump's benefit. He was very angry that the UAW endorsed Joe Biden in this election. He thinks he's the better candidate for those union workers. That's why you saw him make the trek here to appeal to the Teamsters. I don't think Nikki Haley's going to come, by the way. She has made the, this appeal to union workers a way for her to try to look more conservative than Donald Trump in a traditional sense, where he sort of boxed her out from the right on so many issues. Here she could say, you want to be with the unions? I want to be with business and traditional Republican interests. And she's trying to appeal to that South Carolina electorate in the Republican mm -hmm. primary coming up in a few weeks. She's also got this um, she, she's entering her grumpy old men era, which right. is a tack line now against both Donald Trump and Joe Biden. So this is interesting. She has this new grumpy old men play off the movie attack on Joe Biden and Donald Trump. It's a new way for her to try to go at both of them, lump them together as too old. The Trump campaign would say this is another thing where she's just throwing spaghetti at the wall, trying to find some attack line that will work against Trump when so many others that her campaign has put money behind and have thus far failed to make much of a dent. Garrett Haig, uh, I would call you like a road warrior, but look, you're so cozy in the studio here. So I'm indoors. It's weird. I appreciate it. I'm sure you do, too. Thank you, Garrett. Appreciate you it. Good to see you. A lot more coming up here on the show, including current and former pro hockey players charged with sexual assault in a scandal we first covered more than a year ago. We're going one-on-one -on -one with a reporter who's been following all of it from the beginning about what's next in this investigation and what it could mean for hockey writ large. To a lawsuit now that a lot of folks are watching as the family of a New Jersey high school student who died by suicide has now filed this suit against that Board of Education and school officials. This is after 14-year-old Adriana Cush died by suicide just two days after cell phone video of her being viciously attacked in the school hallway was posted online. We're going to show you a very small part of that video with obviously a warning that people will find it disturbing. <laughs> That cell phone video showed Adriana being hit in the face with no warning by somebody holding a water bottle right near the lockers in the hallway. The attack just kept going. The lawsuit alleges school officials were aware that they'd known about a culture of harassment, intimidation, bullying, and that they failed to protect Kush. Lawyers for her family in a statement saying that the assault and video led to her public humiliation and ultimate suicide. Valerie Castro is joining us now. Tell us more about this suit and the response from the school district tonight. Well, Hallie, the lawsuit alleges that school officials, including an anti-bullying specialist, were aware of incidents of harassment in the years before this incident with Adriana. And reading directly from the complaint now, it also says that they knew or should have known that the physical assaults and attacks within their schools were being recorded and posted to various social media sites by other students, contrary to school board policy. Hallie, New Jersey does have anti-bullying laws on the books, and it requires every school district to have an anti-bullying policy in place. This district did, and it does have that policy in place, but the lawsuit also alleges that that policy wasn't followed. Hallie. Parents and teachers and some students at that district came out after the attack, saying administrators had a history of ignoring violence in this school going back decades, like 20 years. The school says it's tried to address this issue, this bullying issue after Kush died. What changes have they made? What have they actually done in practice here? So, Helly, in the month after this happened, they came out announcing several changes. They said they were going to increase training for schools, uh, school resource officers um, known as anti-bullying specialists. As I mentioned earlier, they said they were going to add more of those anti-bullying specialists and increase training. They also had plans to launch an app for students to reach out to, a sort of crisis support system. Um, it's unclear if that app was ever implemented. I reached out to the school district today to find out if that was the case. They did not get back to me, and they also have not 
not commented in response to this lawsuit. Hallie. Valerie Castro, thank you very much. If you or somebody you know is struggling with depression or suicidal thoughts, there is help. There is help available for you at the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Call or text 988 or text HOME to the crisis text line 741-741. To a scandal now brewing in the pro hockey world with Canadian police today charging four current NHL players with sexual assault in connection with an incident in Ontario from a few years ago. Here's who we're talking about. Philadelphia Flyers goalie Carter Hart, Dylan Dubé from the Calgary Flames, and two players from the New Jersey Devils, Michael McLeod and Cal Foote. This comes after a former NHL player, now playing in Switzerland, turned himself in on the same charges. All five of them were members of Canada's World Championship junior hockey team in 2018. They're all denying the charges and taking extended leaves from their teams. Let's bring in Rick Westhead, a senior correspondent at the Sports Network in Canada, somebody who originally broke this story back in 22. Rick, we're so glad to have you. As you know, we've been covering this story really since it happened. Um, explain to, to an audience that may not be as familiar with it how you first learned about this scandal and what is said to have happened in a hotel room in 2018. Well, you know, we're always looking for hockey stories in Canada. Hockey is something of a religion. Um, for many decades, Canadians uh, gathered together on Saturday nights watching Hockey Night in Canada. And it, uh, you know, it, in, in much the same way that, that football is beloved in, in the United States, that's the place that hockey has across our country. I got a tip about this when I was over in Europe working on a different story. And as soon as I read the, the lawsuit that uh, was filed and then quickly settled two years ago, I knew that this was a story that was going to shake not just Canadian sports, but Canadian society. And it did. We reported this story, these allegations. Uh, the woman um, known as EM in court documents alleged that following a golf and gala ev event that she'd gone back to a hotel and had consensual sex with a player she didn't name. And then she alleges that the player, without her knowledge, started texting his teammates and inviting them to come back and also have sex with her. Uh, she named, uh, she said there were eight unnamed players who engaged in this behavior. And of course that lawsuit was settled. Well, after we did that reporting, it led to parliamentary hearings, um, a maelstrom of controversy across Canada. The you know, sponsors started walking away from Hockey Canada, the National Federation, and the entire board of Hockey Canada was turned over. And then things went quiet. You know, we only learned later that the police in London, Ontario, had um, closed the investigation without laying charges in February 19th. And then after there was more media attention, they reopened the case. Well, after a long period of time, we finally know this week that the police mm. in London decided to press ahead and lay charges against these five players, charges of sexual assault, which in Canada can lead to a maximum of 10 years in prison. But police aren't going to say anything until this press conference Monday, right? I mean, that seems to be the sense that they're kind of staying tight-lipped until then. What's the expectation? Yeah, that's right. They'd, again, in very different um, legal systems between Canada and the United States. In the U.S., far easier for journalists to get access to information before a trial. You know, I cover cases in the U.S. as well. You can get mm -hmm. police statements. You can get mug shots, no problem. In Canada, absolutely not. Uh, there's a belief, uh, you know, in the legal system anyways, that, that, that giving that kind of information out could prejudice, prejudice a trial and, and people obviously have the presumption of innocence as these players have. Um, I, although I think that the London police on Monday are still going to come under some pretty hard questioning because again, we need to understand it's in the public interest to understand what changed between February, 2019 uh, when London police decided that there was not enough evidence to move forward with charges. And now, now that they have um, laid charges, is it public pressure? Is it government pressure? Is there evidence that they have now that they didn't have before? Um, you know, is was, in 2019, was that just another example of Canadian police at the time mm. um, deciding that uh, allegations that were credible were actually unfounded? That's been a kind of an ongoing controversy in Canada, and I'm sure in the United States as well where um, alleged victims of sexual assault have had their cases dismissed um, without going ahead with fulsome investigations. Rick, really quickly here, because we mentioned that several of these players, four of them, are currently in the NHL taking leave. Have we heard anything from the NHL about this? No, they, the NHL has been very quiet. Uh, 
also the timing is so interesting. Uh, the NHL All-Star Game is this weekend in Toronto. And mm -hmm. on Friday, Gary Bettman, the NHL's commissioner, uh, will be holding a press conference. And surely the league will be getting a lot of questions. Uh, I'm sure they'll be asked, for instance, whether these players uh, in the years, in the, in the months and year leading up to the trial will be allowed to return to the NHL. Rick Westhead, we're glad to have you following all of these developments for us, as you say, um, hugely significant, not just here, but where you are in Canada. Appreciate it. We are coming on the air tonight with what could be a watershed moment for social media as we saw anger and emotion and blame on Capitol Hill aimed at tech CEOs from senators and from parents who point the finger at social media for playing a part in their children's suicides. The stunning moment Meta's CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, turned around and apologized to them in just a minute. Plus, who the U.S. is blaming for the deaths of three American service members in Jordan. And what we're learning tonight about the options the president is considering for striking back. Then, what else we know about a disturbing and gruesome murder posted on YouTube for everyone to see? As a Pennsylvania man talked about right-wing conspiracy theories, the suspect allegedly behind it, now in police custody. Plus, concerns about crime in Oakland prompting one big company to offer employees security escorts to and from the parking lot. And they're not the only ones making changes. What the whole thing signals about the situation in the Bay Area. And the Fed chair laying out a little bit of a timetable for when interest rates may start to get a little bit lower. We'll tell you when later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And tonight, what could be a critical moment on Capitol Hill? What could be? A critical moment with these big tech CEOs lining up to answer the senators who say they failed to protect children. Dramatic moments, blistering questions, some heated criticism, not just from lawmakers, but from parents, the CEOs, forced to confront them as these parents showed up dressed in black, holding photos of their dead children. They say social media contributed to their kids' suicides, leading to a moment that we have not seen play out like this on the Hill before. Mark Zuckerberg, the head of Meta, literally turning around to apologize to them. Watch. Victim, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. There's families of victims here today. Have you apologized to the victims? I, Would I'm, you like to do so now? Well, they're here. You're on national television. Would you like now to apologize to the victims who have been harmed by your product? Show them the pictures. <laughs> Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? I'm sorry for everything that you have all gone through. It's terrible. No one should have to go through the things that your families have, have suffered. The committee chair saying this is the biggest audience he's ever seen at a hearing. It is more than two decades on that panel. And the tension was very intense all over the room. One senator laying out what he sees as on the line. Very clearly. Watch. Mr. Zuckerberg, you and the companies before us, I know you don't mean to it to be so, but you have blood on your hands. You have a product. You have a product that's killing people. You've seen a lot of Mark Zuckerberg here. He was probably the highest profile executive to show up, but the leaders of TikTok and Discord and Snap all testifying as well. Some after being served subpoenas personally from U.S. Marshals to come in and to speak. You've heard us talk about it on this show, report after report on how bad social media can be for the mental health of teenagers and how sexually abusive material targeting kids can thrive on some of these platforms. The reality is these tech companies are protected under the law, under something called Section 230, which shields them from responsibility for what's posted on their sites by other people. That was a big focus today, right? Is there anything Congress can realistically do? Any law that Congress can actually pass to try to hold these companies accountable and make these platforms safer places? I want to bring in Sahil Kapoor, who's been covering for this, uh, covering this for us on Capitol Hill. The, the issue of safety, right? Wherever you were sitting in that room, uh, at the dais, in front of it, kids' safety was number one. That was the number one priority, as we saw so many intense moments from both the senators and from the CEOs here. What stood out to you? That's right, Hallie. It was no doubt a chilly reception that these tech CEOs faced on Capitol Hill. There were a number of confrontations, dramatic moments, there were pithy lines, and in the course of all of that, even a case of mistaken nationality. Let's play, for starters, a highlight reel of some of the moments that stood out. If you're waiting on these guys to 
solve the problem, we're going to die waiting. It appears that you're trying to be the premier sex trafficking no, Of course not, Senator. In this uh, country. Senator, that's ridiculous. No, it Senator, is not ridiculous. Have you ever been a member of the Chinese Communist Party? No, Senator. Again, okay. I'm Singaporean. Uh, Senator, my understanding is that we don't allow sexually explicit content uh, on, on the service for people of any age. Um, the, the, um, how is that going? Now, on a serious note, Hallie, I spoke to Senator Dick Durbin, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, who has served in Congress for decades. He told me that this was one of the most overwhelming hearings he has attended. He was struck by how the room was packed with families showing pictures of kids that have been exploited. Also, I spoke to Senator Richard Blumenthal, one of the members on the panel who has sponsored legislation to tackle some of these safety issues for children. He said what stood out to him was the lack of trust, that Congress cannot trust big tech to protect children, that Congress, at the end of the day, has to act. That is where the rubber meets the road. Is Congress going to take action or is this going to be another one of those rituals where they haul in these CEOs, where they confront them, they create these viral moments and end up doing nothing about it? Some of the, the, the what we saw here, Sahil, and I think you're hitting on an important point here that they ended up doing nothing about it. Um, that's the key question. And you'll notice at the top of our show, we started this by saying it could be a key moment. It could be a watershed moment, but it could also not be, depending on what, if anything, Congress actually does. So what is on the table here and what is realistic, even in an election year, for something to move forward? One of the things we saw today was senators peppering these tech CEOs with questions about, do you support this bill? Do you support my bill? Why don't you support this bill or that bill? Let's play a little bit of what Senator Amy Klobuchar had to say in the midst of all of that. It's been 28 years, what, since the internet? We haven't passed any of these bills because everyone's double talk, double talk. It's time to actually pass them. And the reason they haven't passed is because of the power of your company. So let's be really, really clear about that. So what you say matters. Your words matter. In other words, Senator Klobuchar blaming Congress's inaction, in, in part on the lobbying that these groups are doing to you know, make sure that they have a broad runway, free reign to act as they please. What's on the table? There are a number of bills on the table, and let's show some of them. There is the Stop CSAM Act, that stands for Child Sexual Abuse Material. There is the Earn It Act, that stands for Eliminating Abusive and Rampant Neglect. The SHIELD Act, which ensures federal prosecutors have appropriate and effective tools to do their job. The Project Safe Childhood Act, which would modernize the prosecution of online child sex uh, and exploitation crimes. Uh, the Kids Online Safety Act, which was the Richard Blumenthal bill that I mentioned, creates a liability for platforms that recommend or promote content to minors that is detrimental to their mental health. What can pass here? It's very unclear. Some of these bills have been approved by the Judiciary Committee, but the next step is they've got to get the requisite 60 votes. They've got to be put on the floor. That's a decision for Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who has not scheduled anything at this moment, Ali. Sahil Kapoor, thank you very much. Uh, lots to follow there, and I know you will be. Appreciate it. Let's take you overseas now, because U.S. officials say today an umbrella group of militias backed by Iran planned and facilitated the drone attack, that deadly attack that killed three U.S. troops in Jordan. As we're just learning from the National Guard, 41 others were hurt as well. Listen. It certainly has the earmarks of the kinds of things that Qatab Hezbollah does. As the president said, we're going to respond, and we'll, we'll respond in, a, in an appropriate way. The president holding an emotional call with the family of one of the three soldiers who died in that attack, Specialist Kennedy Sanders. This is the moment the president told the family their daughter was being promoted posthumously to sergeant. Very emotional. Watch. Oh, wow. That is the best news I've heard today. Thank you so much. You don't know how much that means to us. It comes as we're learning tonight more about how the U.S. could end up striking back at Iran, with officials describing it to NBC News as, in their words, a campaign, a campaign that could potentially last weeks. Keir Simmons is joining us now, and that word, Keir, is interesting, right? Campaign. We don't have finalized plans on what that might look like, but it does seem to indicate something that is not just a one-off, right? Um, which is different from how the U.S. has retaliated to other attacks, not deadly attacks, but other attacks by some of these Iran-backed groups. I think that's right, and I think it's also the White House, Halley, kind of preparing us in a way perhaps they didn't. If you just think back just a few weeks 
to when they launched those attacks on the Houthis in Yemen. And immediately everyone asked, well, there's going to have to be more, isn't there? And there were. And they didn't quite have an answer for that initially. So I think in some ways what they're doing is just signalling to say, this is going to take a while. Don't expect quick solutions, which is understandable because there are no easy solutions in this region. Hadi, let's just throw up the details of what the White House is saying. Uh, this is going to look like what they've told uh, so far. Uh, the campaign could last weeks, as you mentioned. The military strike it could be, it's going to be likely military strikes and cyber operations. There'll be multiple targets in multiple countries uh, involving Iranian targets outside of Iran. That's important. It suggests there won't be uh, hits in Iran and that the precise targets have not yet been finalised. So uh, we don't know when this is going to happen. There is criticism suggesting that some of these Iranian-backed militias are here in Iraq, for example. Uh, we're hearing uh, moving out of bases and are able to prepare, if you like, for the strikes that could come. But it is still possible uh, that facilities could be severely damaged and, and that would have oh. an impact. There have been many strikes, though, on these groups already, Halley, in, in the months gone. And so far, it doesn't appear to have had a, a noticeable impact, certainly not a, a substantial impact. Can you tell us more about one of these militant groups, right? Um, uh, Katab Hezbollah, which John Kirby referenced. They're saying they're suspending yeah. attacks now on U.S. forces. I, I think there's obviously some skepticism on that, right? A, a humongously massive grain of salt that you take that right. Yeah, no question. I mean, Katab Hezbollah is just one of the groups here. It is the group suspected of carrying out that attack at the weekend where three uh, U.S. service members uh, were killed. Um, I, I spoke to a, a government advisor here uh, who has served in the U.S. military for many, many years uh, here in, in Iraq. This is what he had to say about how we should interpret that uh, announcement. There could be cyber attacks, cyber attacks that you and I and your viewers will never see. It can send a strong message to Tehran and the Iranian leaders and their military forces that you're not going to mess with Uncle Sam. And that, of course, was him talking about the kinds of attacks that we might see from the Biden and Biden administration. Uh, but again, the, the question really is, how do you uh, push Iran away yeah. from its long-term goal, which is to try to push America out of this region. Keir Simmons, live for us there in Erbil. Keir, uh, thank you so much. As, of course, the Secretary of State, as we've learned, is getting ready to head to the region as well. Let's take it back here to the West Coast, because more than 20 million people there are under flood watches, bracing for a couple of monster storms that could bring a ton of chaos, a ton of rain, a bunch of snow, major potential for flooding. Maybe up to five inches of rain in certain spots. As one storm flies in, another right on its heels. Kathy Park is in it in Half Moon Bay up in Northern California. Uh, a bit of an appetizer sprinkling for you here, but the main course is really going to pick up steam the next, uh, I don't know, later on tonight, next few hours, over the course of the next couple days. Hallie, I think that's a great way of putting it. Officials are saying, look, be on alert now because this weather can become extremely dangerous. Flash flooding, obviously a big concern because we're getting slammed with heavy bands of rain. Of course, the wind gusts, extreme wind gusts could potentially pull down power lines and trees. So we could be looking at widespread power outages. And because of these concerns, crews were out today reinforcing some of the levees throughout Northern California. The governor of California, Governor Newsom, activated the state operations center. But I want to show you something, Hallie. Behind me is Half Moon Bay. That's the ocean right there. You can see how ferocious it is. The waves is crashing over the rocks. This is something that we have been seeing throughout the day today. But as you said, this is just part one. It's supposed to deteriorate. The conditions are expected to get worse throughout the coming hours. And this is just round one as far as the atmospheric river goes. Another one is supposed to be right behind it next week. And believe it or not, Hallie, we actually spoke with uh, kite boarders earlier today. And and they're saying that these conditions are right for what they're doing. They love the gusts. This is something that they live for. So we saw a lot of folks out and about today. But, you know, we've been out here at Afu Bay pretty much uh, the entire afternoon. And I can tell you things are starting to get worse. So we're told that the evening commute between 6 and 8 o'clock tonight is when we'll get these heavy showers. So flooding, obviously, something that is going to be on uh, everyone's minds later on this evening.
Allie? That is for sure. Kathy Park, live for us there in Northern California. Kathy, thanks. Uh, appreciate you being out there for us. Tonight, some new details on a pretty stunning and gruesome story we've been following with a Pennsylvania man arrested after allegedly decapitating his father and displaying his head on YouTube while talking about right-wing conspiracy theories. We are obviously not going to show you the disturbing moments from that video, just some of what you see here, because later on in this, that man is seen wearing gloves and holding his dad's head in a plastic bag before the head is then seen in a cooking pot. Now, in the video, the son says his father, Michael Moen, was a federal worker for 20 years, calls him a traitor, calls for the death of other federal officials as well. Tom Winter has been on this story for us since it broke. What do we know about the details of this horrific case and what YouTube is saying about the fact that this ended up on its platform? Right. It's really heartbreaking, Hallie, because it was something where police came across this after being called to the home uh, by the wife and the mother of uh, those two individuals, both the son, uh, Justin Moan, who's been arrested for the uh, for the murder, and as well as her husband, who's obviously the person who's deceased here. So it's a, it's really heartbreaking uh, for the family. As far as Justin Moan is concerned and this video is concerned, it was up for several hours before YouTube took it down. He did not have a large following. It wasn't for a while that it started to be kind of uh, uh, pushed around law enforcement circles. But once they became aware of it, it was something that they used in two ways. One, to identify uh, that it was him, uh, that he was obviously uh, involved in the crime. As you said, he holds up his father's head in the first several seconds of the video. Uh, and then on top of that, they were able to use it for their probable cause uh, on the arrest and the charges because they compared the crime scene to the video and some of the things that were in there uh, to just make sure that it was a match and that this was, in fact, the individual who law enforcement believes uh, does it. YouTube says they took it down because it violated their standards when it comes to violence and extremism. Uh, and obviously, they're trying their best, they say, yeah. uh, to make sure it's not reposted. One of the things we mentioned and that you have reported on was the idea of these right-wing conspiracy theories being mm -hmm. talked about um, during this video. Have police said anything that they've discovered about the potential motivation here? What do we know mm -hmm. on that end? Right. That's not something that they included. And frankly, in talking with police in that police department, Middletown Township, last night, and some of the detectives, they were obviously aware of the video. They said they had downloaded it. They asked if, if I had seen it and, you know, was aware of the type of things that were on there. And of course, I had at that point. In the course of my discussions with them, it became very clear that they were relying on this video, uh, not just for what I described from a standpoint of matching him to the uh, to this crime scene, but also with respect to motivations. He's very clear the reason why he did it. He said his father was a federal employee for over 20 years and, quote, he is mm. now in hell for eternity as a traitor to this country. So he's very clear, and you can see there on the screen all the types of things that he said. And so it's obvious that this individual has had some disturbed thoughts for a long time, not just somebody who's left-leaning or right-leaning, uh, but somebody who has uh, views that are on the outer fringes uh, of what's out there online and what's talked about. Tom Winter, uh, thank you very much for your reporting on this, uh, this one, a, a difficult story, as so many are. Appreciate it. Yes. Let's take it to the border now, because House Republicans here in Washington, there is a nexus, are promising to hold what they're calling a long overdue vote to impeach the Homeland Security Secretary, with Speaker Mike Johnson devoting his first speech on the House floor, criticizing the Biden administration for, in his words, shifting the blame. Watch this. President Biden wants to somehow try to shift the blame to Congress for his administration's catastrophe by design. It's absolutely laughable. No one's falling for this. Speaker Johnson led House Republicans, is leading them in this charge. And overnight, we saw that committee vote to advance the first impeachment charges against a cabinet secretary in nearly 150 years when Alexander Graham Bell made that first telephone call. David Noriega is live for us in Eagle Pass, Texas. There is a nexus to where you're sitting, David, and to where I'm sitting here in Washington, right? Because it is a humanitarian crisis at the border. It is a, it is a complicated picture in Eagle Pass, where you are, that's become a flashpoint. There is also a political backdrop that is a part of this conversation as well, especially as we're getting into new numbers that show Americans in key swing states are not actually, they're not blaming Republicans for this crisis. Walk us through all of it. That's right, Hallie. So this new polling uh, asked voters in key swing states, as in Nevada, Arizona, Michigan, Pennsylvania, et cetera, 
who they believe is responsible for the rise in migrant crossings. The results say that 61% blame Biden, 38% blame, uh, blame Republicans in Congress, and only 30% blame Trump. Now, I will say, through many years of covering this, this story, Ali, this kind of polling is actually a pattern. We've seen this in prior administrations, too, when the border was chaotic under Trump, with numbers going way up, in some cases breaking records of, for example, family units crossing the border in 2019, and people pursuing perceived this as chaotic and disorganized, they blamed Trump for that. And they tend to swing to whatever the other party, the party that's not in power, is proposing as the solution, regardless really of sort of what the um, specifics of, the, of those policy solutions might be. So just politically speaking, this current situation is favorable to Trump and the Republicans. However, Trump says that his opposition to this uh, supposed uh, deal in the Senate on the border that we've been waiting for for weeks now, uh, that his opposition to it is not political. I'll play you a clip of something he said. Take a listen. If the bill's not going to be a great bill and really solve the problem, I wouldn't do it at all. Not for political reasons, just for U.S. reasons. He says it's the content of the bill. A lot of analysts, of course, are saying this is, in fact, political. Ali. David Noria, the live for us there in Eagle Pass. We're glad to have you there, David. Thank you. we got to get to some breaking news that's just coming into us tonight because we're learning that Alec Baldwin is pleading not guilty for the second time now to involuntary manslaughter charges connected to the death of a cinematographer on the set of the movie Rust. You probably remember this. It's been... Big news for years now. So this plea from Baldwin means that an arraignment that's been scheduled for tomorrow, it's not going to happen because he's already pleaded. We're not going to see him in court. Let me bring in legal analyst Danny Savalos. So, Danny, it, it is not unexpected, right, that Baldwin is pleading not guilty. The timing is perhaps a little earlier than we thought it would be. But talk about what this means generally for this case moving forward. Yeah, generally speaking, if I'm in a jurisdiction where I can waive arraignment, I will do it. Yeah. Uh, because most of the time an arraignment is just a uh, an event where you can have the option of having the indictment read to you word for word. But if you have an attorney, he can take the indictment and read it to you, or you can just read it yourself. So even though it's a very significant event in that it starts many different clocks in the criminal process, in terms of substance, it's something that you can waive, not appear for, and just enter your not guilty plea literally by the mail. You can mail it in uh, or just provide it to the court otherwise. So that's what is happening procedurally today. And like I said before, uh, I do it in cases where a celebrity isn't involved. You have even more reason as a celebrity to want to waive your arraignment so you don't have to go down uh, and get photographed walking in and pleading not guilty. What's the timeline then for this process to play out here? It really depends on however fast the court can handle this case. I could give you a regular timeline for a regular case, but that might not even apply to this particular jurisdiction and this courthouse. And then even for this courthouse, the timeline is going to be different than it would be for regular mortal average defendants, because as we've seen, and as I always maintain, the regular rules of criminal procedure simply don't apply when the defendant is a famous politician or a movie star or some other kind of celebrity. Uh, whatever it is, it'll be, be more extended. There'll be more motions filed. Already this case, think about it, this was a shooting case, happens sadly thousands of times a year, and we're finally getting an indictment from a shooting. Now we're in 2024, and this shooting occurred in 2021. Danny Savalos, uh, thank you very much for that developing news here tonight out of the West Coast. Appreciate it. Coming up, we'll take you to South Africa, where wildfires are burning out of control. The really rare thing that officials now have to do. Plus, how the company behind Wagovi is planning to get its popular weight loss drug in the hands of more people. One band making a comeback for a residency in Vegas. We're going to tell you who's taking over the sphere in our five things in just a minute. But first, the big news out of the Fed today. Not so much what they did, more what they said. Because they did what everybody thought they'd do. They didn't touch interest rates. But what the Fed chair said was more interesting. He said they probably will not cut rates at the Fed's next meeting either in March. Kind of a surprise to some folks. And if you're hoping for interest rates to go down, if you wanted to maybe get a mortgage or whatever, you may have to wait a little bit longer. Brian Chung is joining us now. Um, we, we talked about the news is there's no news, which normally news people don't talk about, right? But in yeah. this instance, it's actually interesting because the Fed did what people thought they would do, as we said. They kept interest rates alone. The question is, 
What tea leaves might we get from Jay Powell about what could happen at the next couple of meetings? Tell us more about how you're reading those tea leaves. Right. Well, I mean, the action, right, is that the, nothing happens. So what in, instead we're looking for are signals about what they could be doing later down the line. And the anticipation going into this year was when would we see interest rate cuts for the first time since they began aggressively making interest rates higher, which, by the way, is part of the reason for why your mortgage rates and also your credit card rates have been so high. But they've not done anything in the last uh, four meetings, including today's announcement. But there was some anticipation going into today that maybe the first rate cut would happen in their next meeting, which is in March. And basically what the Fed chairman did, poured cold water all over that expectation because he was saying he doesn't see it as likely that they would begin to cut interest rates in that next meeting. Maybe that points to perhaps interest rate cuts happening in May. Either way, a lot of home buyers that are on the sidelines going, eh, is now the time to get in? They may, were, they may have been hoping for some sort of interest rate cuts in March, but the Fed chairman saying you might have to wait a little bit longer. Um, I'm glad to have you on for this conversation because you know the Fed very well. And what's so interesting here is the way that, like, every word, there are very few people in this world for whom every word makes such a distinct, right? every single breath matters for him. Um, that's a... Obviously, on the one hand, a lot of pressure because those breaths can literally move markets. On the other hand, it leads to what we're talking about here, right, which is the idea that we sort of know as they signal far out what they're going to do. And that gets to this idea of a soft landing. That helps inflate that cushion for the, for the Fed to try to land the plane a little bit. I've mixed 100 metaphors there. Please save me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, look, when it comes to what the Fed's been doing here, the idea is how do you try to stop the high inflation that we saw from about a year ago, while at the same time not trying to get people to lose their jobs? Because what happens when the Federal Reserve raises interest rates? Well, that makes business conditions a lot more hard for uh, entrepreneurs and also for large corporations. They maybe start to lay people off. That has happened the last few times the Federal Reserve has aggressively raised interest rates. They did that last year, but we haven't seen the massive layoffs. We've seen them in some pockets. It's like, for example, in media and in tech. But broadly speaking, the Federal Reserve so far has been able to avoid a recession while also getting inflation down, which the government numbers bear out. Now, when it comes to what the Federal Reserve is saying right here, I am fluent in English. I am also fluent in Fed speak. <laughs> the translation here is that the Federal Reserve is saying they could start to cut interest rates later on this year. Doesn't mean 3% mortgage rates, but it could mean marginally lower borrowing costs from here if they can stick that soft landing. We'll have to see. We are glad you are bilingual, Brian Chung, to translate it for the rest of us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Chris Ray, the head of the FBI, warning Chinese hackers are preparing to, in his words, wreak havoc on key infrastructure in this country. We're talking about electric grids, oil and gas pipelines, some transportation systems. You see Ray there telling a House committee today the hackers could cause real world harm to people here and that there really hasn't been enough focus on the cyber threat. Number two, syphilis in 2022 hit its highest level in this country since the 50s, according to a new CDC report. The agency says cases have gone up 80% in the last five years. And while syphilis is most common in gay and bisexual men, officials say it's now expanding in heterosexual men and women, and increasingly it's affecting newborns. The rate of gonorrhea, however, has dropped for the first time in a decade. Number three, reports of lasers pointed at planes that are flying, illegally, by the way, is spiking. It hit a record high this past year, up 40% from the year before, according to the FAA. The lasers are a problem, folks. They can distract pilots. They can make pilots temporarily blind. Experts say they think they're seeing more of these laser strikes, as they're called, because it's cheap to get some of these laser pointers, and also because more pilots are reporting it when it happens. Number four, some new research out of Harvard and Stanford shows students have made up a lot of ground academically since the pandemic, but they're nowhere close to being caught up. In math, students have made up about a third of what they lost, but it's less in reading, and the gap between wealthy and poor districts has only grown. Number five, France, cutting the number of people set to attend the opening Olympic ceremony in half. Was going to be 600,000 people now there. Now it's only about 300,000 people, so not as many eyeballs there on that big event. The organizers have not yet said why they are making this change. You can obviously, of course, watch the opening ceremony right here on NBC when it happens later this summer. When we come back, remember that whole Disney versus DeSantis thing? Well, that lawsuit is getting thrown out today. Why the so-called House of the Mouse may not be done fighting Florida's governor just yet. Plus, an unlikely porch pirate. Stay with us.
NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our international teams have done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of France, a tractor takeover. Remember this week we told you about French farmers protesting things like rising costs and environmental rules? It's getting more intense. So you see if farmers are blocking this highway, police showed up at a food market. They arrested more than a dozen people. The protests have become kind of contagious. They've spread to some other countries in Europe, all right ahead of a big EU meeting on this topic tomorrow. Out of South Africa, look at this, wildfires burning out of control around Cape Town. It's been really hot and dry there. Remember, it's summer there. There's been strong coastal winds. There was one village nearby that was evacuated. That's pretty rare. Fortunately, nobody's been reported to have been hurt, but officials put out a code red. That means serious, immediate danger. And out of Malaysia, today, a billionaire sultan who rules a state in the southern part of the country became king. Malaysia uses a rotating monarchy system where state rulers take turns as king, typically kind of a ceremonial role. It's like a tradition thing, but lately it's been taking on more political influence. The new king says he will not be a puppet and wants to get a high-speed rail project going. To a new wrinkle tonight in the fight between Disney and Florida's governor, with a federal judge dismissing a lawsuit from Disney against Ron DeSantis. Remember what this is all about? Disney sued after the governor pulled a special tax status for Disney World in Orlando. They said it was an act of retaliation after Disney came out against that controversial so-called don't say gay law in 2022, that public education law in Florida. Well, a judge is like, nope, toss the whole thing. It's gone, dropped. Judge says Disney's claims fail on the merits. In other words, they're not making the case they think they are, and that they don't have standing, meaning they're not actually allowed to bring this case anyway. Sam Brock is live for us in Miami. This is another twist in the long saga of many twists and turns between Disney versus DeSantis, right? Talk us through some of the reaction here, because Ron DeSantis has taken a victory lap, and Disney's promising to appeal. As he should, right? Because it certainly appears like DeSantis has won. You said dismissal, Hallie, on merit and also on standing. But as far as merit is concerned, consider this. This district, the Reedy Creek Improvement District, has been in place since 1967 in Central Florida, allowing Disney to effectively run its own city, raise taxes, decide what to do with particular plots of land. Well, it just so happens that after the company spoke out against the don't say gay, or that's, that's casually known, but really the parental rights and education law that was passed in Florida. After they spoke out mm -hmm. against it, the Florida legislature takes this right away. But what a judge said was, you know what, you can't prove the motivation. You can't prove that was retaliation, even if it was six decades of status quo. So that's that. But as far as the reaction right now, here's what Disney has to say. The president itself is something that's worth fighting for. This is the company's exact words. This is an important case with serious implications for the rule of law. And it will not end here. If left unchallenged, this would set a dangerous precedent and give license to states to weaponize their official powers to punish the expression of political viewpoints that they disagree with. But as we mentioned, the judge dismissed this. Here's what DeSantis said in his response. The federal court's decision made it clear that Governor DeSantis was correct. Disney is still just one of many corporations in the state, and they do not have a right to their own special government. The legal avenues that Disney now has at its disposal to try to fight this are very limited, meaning this will likely stand. Can you give us a, an update on where things stand related to sort of the practical impact here? Because when this is all going on, we talked about what the revocation of the special tax status could mean to Disney. Like the monorail system, for example, some of the grounds. There could be, I think there was some discussion that DeSantis could end up building, or the state could build like a prison nearby, I think. Um, wh where does all of that stand now, Sam? Like, is there any, if you go to Disney World now, any difference from what it was two years ago? Right, there's been no imminent changes, but it's hard to predict what's gonna happen in the future. You're exactly Fair. right, though. Now you have this Central Tourism Board, Oversight Board, which was picked, handpicked by the governor. They decide what happens on the land. If they wanna put a prison on there, they can. If it's more housing, they can do that as well. If they wanna raise taxes for the residents, that is also a possibility. But the key point to all of this was there's about a billion dollars in debt. Initially, DeSantis had talked about getting rid of this district, special district altogether. But what about all of that money that's owed? So mm -hmm. now there's five different people that are appointed by DeSantis to go in. They call the shots. They make the decisions from here on out. And it appears like Disney, there's very little that they have at their disposal to fight that, except maybe a new law lawsuit under new different grounds, Hallie. But that seems to be unlikely at this point. Sam Brock, live for us there in the state of Florida. Sam, thank you so much. Thanks, Let's talk Sam. about the, speaking of Ron DeSantis, who, of course, dropped out of that Republican presidential race a couple of weeks ago.
Still two candidates left, including former President Donald Trump, who is actually here in Washington today, trying to get some Teamsters support, meeting with the Teamsters union, trying to take a cut of a union that back in 2020 supported President Biden. It's coming as the New York Times is reporting that the former president spent a bunch of money, maybe about $50 million worth, on legal fees last year. Donation money on his legal fees. With the former president addressing some of that reporting today. Watch. Are you thinking of potentially trying to use campaign money to pay some of those penalties that you, that you might incur in the, New York in the New York fraud case and the defamation case? I didn't do anything wrong. I mean, that's been proven as far as I'm concerned. That was a political case coordinated with the White House by the Attorney General, I assume is what you're talking about. And we won that case largely in the Court of Appeals. We should find out more tonight when campaign filings come in, how much specifically the former president has spent on the variety of these things. As Nikki Haley, his competitor in the GOP primary, is also chasing some big money donors in Florida today. It's after going after Mr. Trump on X, saying he can't beat President Biden if he's spending all his time and money on court cases and chaos. Garrett Hake is joining us now. There have been some sort of interesting potpourri type moments. Let's start with the first bucket of campaign cash mm -hmm. for former President Trump. Not to get too nerdy, not to get too weedsy. Filings obviously do. So we're, we're going to get real insight here, more insight than we have so far, and what exactly he's spending to pay for all these legal issues, which he has, right? Mm -hmm. He's paying lawyers for these legal fights. Talk us through that. Well, his pack is, and that's part of the problem here. So we're in, we're in fundraising season here now, which is part of why all this matters. And by the way, we have confirmed this idea that money that he is raising is going into this. We know that he's using political money to pay legal fees. And I think that's part of the reason he talked about this. Which, the way by the way, that he, that's not illegal. Legal. No, it's not within reason. So, like, that's part of the reason he talked about it the way he did today. The FEC says you can spend money on legal fees if the legal fees arise based on your candidacy. So it's part of the reason why Trump describes all of this as political, that even the Gene Carroll case as political, because it makes it easier for him to argue that money he spends in his defense is related to his campaign. That was that defamation case in which he was slapped with an 80-plus million dollar uh, right. verdict. That's right. And so that's the other part of this, because even if he spent every dime that, that his, spe his special political action committee has raised, he couldn't cover all of that money. He's going to have to spend some of Donald J. Trump's own money to cover that. That's the kind of thing we know he hates, going back to his time in private development. He, he talked about this in his book, that he doesn't like spending his own money on basically anything. He can't really borrow against this. He's going to have to spend his own money here at some point. But we also know that politically, at least in a primary election, his supporters, as we've seen in polling again and again, the Republican primary electorate, they don't mind. No. They don't mind that he's doing this, that this is happening. Maybe a different question come a general election. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, up until now, these charges basically across the board have been rocket fuel for his campaign, both in terms of poll numbers and in donations. I mean, it does, it's not only that they don't mind, it's that Republican primary voters so have Calvinized. identified. Yeah. Absolutely, exactly. They've identified with Donald Trump. They agree with him that he's being targeted. They've been more than happy to spend their money. But when you look at some of the polling data about what happens in a general election, you do start to see voters break away. There's a significant percentage of, of Republican leaning voters, of independent voters who say in some of these swing states in particular that they will not be as likely to support a candidate who's convicted of something. So again, the timing starts to matter here, the mm. specifics start to matter here, and the fact that all these cases appear to be getting pushed off is starting to matter too. And oh, by the way, the reason he's even talking about this is because he was here making an appearance after this Teamsters meeting. We mm -hmm. know President Biden will also meet with the Teamsters. I believe Nikki Haley is set to meet as well. Union support is going to matter this election. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And it mattered in the last election, too. The, and the break between union leadership and union rank and file has always been something that's accrued to Donald Trump's benefit. He was very angry that the UAW endorsed Joe Biden in this election. He thinks he's the better candidate for those union workers. That's why you saw him make the trek here to appeal to the Teamsters. I don't think Nikki Haley's going to come, by the way. She has made the, this appeal to union workers a way for her to try to look more conservative than Donald Trump in a traditional sense, where he sort of boxed her out from the right on so many issues. Issues. Here she could say, you want to be with the unions? I want to be with business and traditional Republican interests. And she's trying to appeal to that South Carolina electorate in the Republican mm -hmm. primary coming up in a few weeks. She's also got this, um, she, she's entering her grumpy old men era, which That's is right. attack line now against both Donald Trump and Joe Biden. So this is interesting. She has this new grumpy old men play off the movie attack on Joe Biden and Donald Trump. It's a new way for her to try to go at both of them, lump them together as too old. The Trump campaign would say this is another thing where she's just throwing spaghetti at the wall, trying to find some attack line that will work against Trump, when so many others that her campaign has put money behind have thus far failed to make much of a dent. Garrett Haake, uh, 
I would call you like a road warrior, but look, you're so cozy in the studio here. So. I'm indoors. Our, it's weird. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm sure you do too. Thank you, Garrett. Appreciate you it. Good to see you. A lot more coming up here on the show, including current and former pro hockey players charged with sexual assault in a scandal we first covered more than a year ago. We're going one on one with a reporter who's been following all of it from the beginning about what's next in this investigation and what it can mean for hockey writ large. To a lawsuit now that a lot of folks are watching as the family of a New Jersey high school student who died by suicide has now filed this suit against that Board of Education and school officials. This is after 14-year-old Adriana Cush died by suicide just two days after cell phone video of her being viciously attacked in the school hallway was posted online. We're going to show you a very small part of that video with obviously a warning that people will find it disturbing. That cell phone video showed Adriana being hit in the face with no warning by somebody holding a water bottle right near the lockers in the hallway. The attack just kept going. The lawsuit alleges school officials were aware that they'd known about a culture of harassment, intimidation, bullying, and that they failed to protect Kush. Lawyers for her family in a statement saying that the assault and video led to her public humiliation and ultimate suicide. Valerie Castro is joining us now. Tell us more about this suit and the response from the school district tonight. Well, Hallie, the lawsuit alleges that school officials, including an anti-bullying specialist, were aware of incidents of harassment in the years before this incident with Adriana. And reading directly from the complaint now, it also says that they knew or should have known that the physical assaults and attacks within their schools were being recorded and posted to various social media sites by other students, contrary to school board policy. Hallie, New Jersey does have anti-bullying laws on the books, and it requires every school district to have an anti-bullying policy in place. This district did, and it does have that policy in place, but the lawsuit also alleges that that policy wasn't followed. Hallie. Parents and teachers and some students at that district came out after the attack, saying administrators had a history of ignoring violence in this school going back decades, like 20 years. The school says it's tried to address this issue, this bullying issue after Kush died. What changes have they made? What have they actually done in practice here? So, Hallie, in the month after this happened, they came out announcing several changes. They said they were going to increase training for schools, uh, school resource officers um, known as anti-bullying specialists. As I mentioned earlier, they said they were going to add more of those anti-bullying specialists and increase training. They also had plans to launch an app for students to reach out to, a sort of crisis support system. Um, it's unclear if that app was ever implemented. I reached out to the school district today to find out if that was the case. They did not get back to me, and they also have not commented in response to this lawsuit. Hallie. Valerie Castro, thank you very much. If you or somebody you know is struggling with depression or suicidal thoughts, there is help. There is help available for you at the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Call or text 988 or text HOME to the crisis text line 741-741. To a scandal now brewing in the pro hockey world with Canadian police today charging four current NHL players with sexual assault in connection with an incident in Ontario from a few years ago. Here's who we're talking about. Philadelphia Flyers goalie Carter Hart, Dylan Dubé from the Calgary Flames, and two players from the New Jersey Devils, Michael McLeod and Cal Foote. This comes after a former NHL player, now playing in Switzerland, turned himself in on the same charges. All five of them were members of Canada's World Championship junior hockey team in 2018. They're all denying the charges and taking extended leaves from their teams. Let's bring in Rick Westhead, a senior correspondent at the Sports Network in Canada, somebody who originally broke this story back in 22. Rick, we're so glad to have you. As you know, we've been covering this story really since it happened. Um, explain to, to an audience that may not be as familiar with it how you first learned about this scandal and what is said to have happened in a hotel room in 2018. Well, you know, we're always looking for hockey stories in Canada. Hockey is something of a religion. Um, for many decades, Canadians uh, gathered together on Saturday nights watching Hockey Night in Canada. And it, uh, you know, it, in, in much the same way that, that football is beloved in, in the United States, that's the place that hockey has across our country. I got a tip about this when I was over in Europe working on a different story. And as soon as I read the, the lawsuit that uh, was filed and then quickly settled two years ago, I knew that this was a story that was going to shake not just Canadian sports, but Canadian society. And it did. We reported this story, these allegations,
allegations. Uh, the woman um, known as EM in court documents alleged that following a golf and gala ev event that she'd gone back to a hotel and had consensual sex with a player she didn't name. And then she alleges that the player, without her knowledge, started texting his teammates and inviting them to come back and also have sex with her. Uh, she named, uh, she said there were eight unnamed players who engaged in this behavior. And of course that lawsuit was settled. Well, after we did that reporting, it led to parliamentary hearings, um, a maelstrom of controversy across Canada. The you know sponsors started walking away from Hockey Canada, the National Federation, and the entire board of Hockey Canada was turned over. And then things went quiet. You know, we only learned later that the police in London, Ontario, had um, closed the investigation without laying charges in February 19th. And then after there was more media attention, they reopened the case. Well, after a long period of time, we finally know this week that the police mm. in London decided to press ahead and lay charges against these five players, charges of sexual assault, which in Canada can lead to a maximum of 10 years in prison. But police aren't going to say anything until this press conference Monday, right? I mean, that seems to be the sense that they're kind of staying tight-lipped until then. What's the expectation? Yeah, that's right. They'd, again, in very different um, legal systems between Canada and the United States. In the U.S., far easier for journalists to get access to information before a trial. You know, I cover cases in the U.S. as well. You can get mm -hmm. police statements. You can get mug shots, no problem. In Canada, absolutely not. Uh, there's a belief, uh, you know, in the legal system, anyways, that 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 giving that kind of information out could prejudice prejudice a trial, and and people obviously have the presumption of innocence, as these players have. Um, I, although I think that the London police on Monday are still going to come under some pretty hard questioning, because again, we need to understand. It's in the public interest to understand what changed between February 2019, uh, when London police decided that there was not enough evidence to move forward with charges, and now, now that they have um, laid charges. Is it public pressure? Is it government pressure? Is there evidence that they have now that they didn't have before? Um, you know, is was in 2019, was that just another example of Canadian police at the time mm. um, deciding that uh, allegations that were credible were actually unfounded? That's been a kind of an ongoing controversy in Canada, and I'm sure in the United States as well, where um, alleged victims of sexual assault have had their cases dismissed um, without going ahead with fulsome investigations. Rick, really quickly here, because we mentioned that several of these players, four of them, are currently in the NHL taking leave. Have we heard anything from the NHL about this? No, they, the NHL has been very quiet. Uh, also, the timing is so interesting. Uh, the NHL All-Star Game is this weekend in Toronto. And mm -hmm. on Friday, Gary Bettman, the NHL's commissioner, uh, will be holding a press conference. And surely the league will be getting a lot of questions. Uh, I'm sure they'll be asked, for instance, whether these players... Uh, in the years, in the, in the months and year leading up to the trial, will be allowed to return to the NHL. Rick Westhead, we're glad to have you following all of these developments for us. As you say, um, hugely significant, not just here, but where you are in Canada. Appreciate it. Well, that does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.